Okay, I am Devapratha Ghoshal of Washington Quantum Computing, Quantum Computing Meetup DC. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all for coming. Okay, <clears throat> so we have a um, talk today. Speaker is Mr. Doug Finke and the topic is a tour through the quantum ecosystem. Uh, he will go over soon about the topic, but we have a moderator here. We are fortunate to have Nathan Spoor, the co-organizer of Bay Area Quantum Computing Meetup. So uh, he will, uh, you know, do the moderator <clears throat> job. Now we have two sponsors, uh, as you know, CQC, Cambridge Quantum Computing, and Association Quantum. So I have to talk about the Association Quantum because they are our new, new sponsors. Association Quantum is a not-for-profit not organization which is dedicated to spreading quantum knowledge. They have a lot of exciting webinars coming up. So check out their website for more, do for more details. They are also supporting other meetup groups with webinars. So if you need any help, please feel free to contact them. Now, the other um, announcement I have about the Association Quantum, they have on Thursday, June 11, Quantum Beyond Co Computing. Check it out. Check it out their website. It used to be June 10, but they rescheduled it today. It would be June 11, okay? Just take a note of it. Dr. John Donahue will um, um, talk about quantum beyond computing. The next one is ours on, on Tuesday, June 16. <clears throat> this is about investment landscapes of quantum information science. It will be done by Andre M. Koenig author, speaker, and investor of So please join us on next Tuesday also. If you can, check out our site. Now I'm giving it to Nathan Skor for introducing um, Doug. Thank you. OK. Um, hi. I'm Nathan. Can anyone, can you, everyone hear me? Can you unmute some people so uh, they can confirm that we're being heard? We had uh, some noise issues. Yes, Nathan. Uh, oh, yes. Okay, fine. Sure. Okay, I'm getting that. Okay. So, hi, I'm Nathan Shore uh, from the Bay Area, as you can see from my background. Uh, by the way, I hope you guys appreciate that view. It cost me quite a lot to rent it so you could see it. And uh, I'm going to moderate the event, and the event is going to uh, speaker will be Doug Fink, who's been watching the quantum information world since 2015. So he's really well qualified to uh, discuss the content with us. And I uh, just want to take a few, before Doug comes on, I want to take a few seconds to explain to you how we got here. Um, I'm part of a, uh, we recently collaborated uh, various cities that are doing, they were doing quantum meetup because of the C-19 situation. So between those of us in Portland and DC and Toronto and the Bay Area, Philadelphia and Southern Cal, the meetup administrators of those cities, we got together and we said, hey, let's share our, our various content. And what you're seeing today is the first inaugural uh, session of that. We're going to have several more as, uh, as time goes on. And, and you'll, uh, as you join the meetups, you'll know because we'll do the announcements. So, uh, we're going to get started in about 10 seconds, but here's the basic rule. If you have a question, please put it in the q and I'll be watching out for that. And Doug will stop frequently and periodically throughout his talk uh, so we can address those questions. Okay. Uh, so, Doug, I'll turn it over to you, and let's get started. Okay, Nathan, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thanks the organizers for uh, getting all this set up. 
Um, as I mentioned, I will be speaking about the quantum ecosystem. Um, hold on, there you go. And uh, really the purpose of this presentation is just to give everyone an idea of the breadth of, of all the different organizations that are working and, and how they interact. It, it's actually a very complicated ecosystem at this point, but I'll, I'll try to straighten it out. I've classified it a little bit and I, I've showed who some of the players are. Uh, uh, just one note though, is I am only covering quantum computing in today's presentation. Um, there's lots of other companies working in quantum communications, quantum sensing, and, and even quantum inspired computing. I, I won't really cover those companies today. Um, if there's some interest, I, I could come back some other day and, and then talk about those companies. Um, so, so what I've done is I've taken the ecosystem and I've really divided it into a few different segments. Um, you know, the, the major segments are the people who are the technology providers, which will include hardware, software, and infrastructure. And then there's uh, the support organizations. And, and basically in this presentation, I will be going through each of those uh, segments, you know, explaining what, what that really means. And I will give examples of companies that participate in that particular segment. Um, the, the other thing I would mention is that I do list many of the companies that are involved in, in quantum uh, ecosystem but I, I just can't list them all. There are hundreds of different companies <laughs> that, that participate in quantum one way or the other. And I, I, I probably will leave out someone's favorite organization. So I, I apologize in advance for that. Um, I do keep a, a, a more complete list on the quantum computing report. And I invite you to uh, take a look at it if, if you're uh, interested in seeing more. So this is really the technology providers and the way I look at this is through this technology stack that I show here, where um, if you just look at that sort of that inverted pyramid in the middle first, it really starts at the chip and then the chip is packaged. There are various control electronics, software for the control electronics, uh, compilers and transpilers, software frameworks, routines, a cloud infrastructure education and user community. And I, I will go through that in more detail in the uh, upcoming slides. And then off to the side, I have the component suppliers. Uh, you know, these guys are very important. They don't directly, um, you know, supply the quantum computing, but they are the suppliers to the chip manufacturers and, and the hardware. And, and I'll talk about those guys uh, in, in the, an upcoming slide. And by the way, the way I will uh, talk about each of these segments, I'm, I'm starting from component suppliers and I'm going from the bottom up. So after the, that will be chip packaging, and et cetera. And then in the support category, and, and I'll talk about that at, at the very end, um, there are a lot of organizations that also provide support in one way or the other either universities to educate a workforce or governments who supply money, uh, there can consultants in media like myself, um, trade organizations. And I will uh, spend a few minutes talking about those because those are also important in order to really you know, make quantum happen and, and make sure it's a success. So I will start now uh, with the hardware providers uh, to talk about all the various companies that uh, provide different hardware aspects. And anytime you build a computer, you need components. And there are suppliers who supply all sorts of things. Um, some of those components are things like resistors and capacitors and power supplies and stuff that you would also need in a classical computer. There are other things that are very specialized um, that are only used in a quantum computer. Uh, Blue Force, for example, supplies dilution refrigerators. Uh, Zurich Instruments has um, waveform generators. Um, this company building lasers, single photon detectors, special cable assemblies. Um, a, a couple at the bottom are, are sort of interesting. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with Global Foundries. They're one of the major wafer processing, semiconductor wafer processing foundries in the world, along with uh, TSMC and, and a few others. 
And uh, I found a couple of um, quantum startup companies, SciQuantum and, and Equal One, which are actually using them as a foundry to build their chips. And the last one is, is really quite interesting. Uh, Gopian is a company in Italy that primarily makes glass cases for museums. So if you go to you know, London and see the crown jewels or something in a, in a glass case, um, they're the ones who make that case. And IBM contracted with them uh, about a year, year and a half ago to come up with a glass enclosure for their IBM Q system one. I'm sure many of you have seen the picture of that and uh, they went to a, an Italy supplier, an Italian supplier to do that. But there's all, you know, there are hundreds of suppliers who supply these components that go into the quantum computers. Now, going back to the chip level now, um, one of the things I do keep track of is companies that are working on qubit chips. Uh, I do have a table in the quantum computing report. I, this table is too big to fit on a slide, so I've just put the summary here. But at this point, uh, we're tracking 113 different projects to de develop chips for qubits. Uh, across 87 organizations. There are some organizations that are actually working on in multiple areas. The areas are across the top, like uh, quantum annealing, superconducting, trapped ion. You can see that superconducting is the most popular. Um, photonic is actually the second most popular, closely followed by trapped ion and, and spin qubits. But there's a number of different technologies that people are working on. And this does include projects that are not only in, at companies, commercial companies, but at universities, government labs, and well, public and private. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the public and private companies in the next slides. So there's some you know, major uh, public corporations, you know, multi-billion dollar corporations that have uh, quantum divisions. And these are the ones that uh, are probably the most prevalent. There may be one or two more um, in, in uh, Asia, but uh, I think everyone is familiar with IBM and Google. Uh, Honeywell is a, working on an ion trap computer, which I expect them to announce uh, more details in the next few weeks. Intel is actually working on two different technologies. Um, this is in their Portland, Oregon uh, facility. They have uh, efforts going on in both superconducting and spin qubits. And Microsoft has a well-publicized uh, hardware effort in topological compute, computing uh, uh, with uh, uh, Majorana's that um, they're working with in conjunction with several different universities. That is still in the research phase. But besides the big public corporations, there's also uh, many, many startup companies. Um, right now we're tracking 34 different startup companies. I think there's 11 or 12 that are in the US and uh, another 20 to 24 or something yeah, overseas. Uh, you know, this truly is a worldwide effort. Uh, one of the things I would mention is that there's a big diversity in the various paths that these startup companies are taking, which I think is a good thing. Um, at this point, the technology is so new, we really don't know which of the semiconductor technologies is gonna be the winner, uh, which, which of the qubit technologies is gonna be the winner. And um, by having people explore multiple paths, uh, I think we have a better chance of um, being able to come up with ones that, that are best. Just because, you know, IBM and Google and Rigetti are working on superconducting does not necessarily mean that 10 or 20 years from now that that will be the dominant uh, technology. I, I don't think anyone really knows which one's going to win at this point, but um, it's, a, it's a good competitive race and I, I'm, you know, I'll be tracking it. I'd be very interesting to see what happens over the next uh, several years. And, and again, the, this only shows companies are working in, on qubits themselves for uh, computing. Uh, it does not include quantum sensing or any hardware like quantum random number generators or, or quantum key distribution. Now, 
at the next level, you know, once you have a qubit chip, uh, you really need to put in control, ways to control those qubits. Uh, someone once said something very, very interesting. They said, if you look at what caused the su success of the Wright brothers, when they came up with the first practical airplane, it was not the fact that they figured out how to build a wing that would give the airplane lift. It was the fact that they came up with a mechanism to control the airplane so they could make it go where they wanted. And that's really the, the same issue here in quantum computing. The qubits themselves can be very uh, error prone and uh, you want to optimize the way you control those. And the way you control those uh, typically is either with microwave pulses that go into the qubits or else uh, lasers that will shine onto the qubits and, and make them go through the various states. So um, some, of the, uh, some of the hardware suppliers like, like IBM and, and Rigetti are, have been building their own, but there's also a, a branch of startup companies that are working to develop both the software and the hardware to control those qubits. And basically what they're, they want to do, what they're trying to do is to uh, see if they can prove the error rates, both the uh, coherence time as well as the gate fidelity time by optimizing the control pulses, pulses that go in into the uh, qubits. Um, you know, IBM has been encouraging this. IBM uh, has a, something in their kids kit called Open Pulse that you may have heard of. And this allows some of these companies to go in and uh, if you want to, let's say, do a, a, a rotation of some type, rather than using the IBM standard pulse sequence to do that rotation, you can uh, use maybe something that Q Control or Quantum Benchmark has has come up with that might actually be able to give you better fidelity. So uh, these are the companies that are doing um, software. All of them are actually have various types of software that will do that. And, and some of them will actually supply the, uh, the hardware that does it too, like quantum machines and uh, uh, Labber, which was recently bought out by Keysight. They have some hardware also that, that, does, that does that. So, um, you know, this, area of the technology isn't really talked about as, as much, although Q Control has been holding webinars recently, but it is actually quite important for um, making, you know, high quality qubits. And, and these guys are all partners with uh, IBM and some of, the other, some of the other platform suppliers. Doug, excuse me a second. We're getting some really good questions. You want to uh, uh, just give you a heads up? Maybe we can take a break soon and address some of them. Well, this is exactly where the break is. I'm going to switch over to software oh, wow. providers. So I was going to say right now, uh, if we have any questions, why don't we answer a few of them right now? Okay. Uh, Paul asked about uh, the relationship between photonics and quantum computing communications, photonics and quantum communications. Well, um, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, there is a lot of work being done in what's called the quantum internet. And, and basically uh, this involves uh, sending photons over a fiber optic cable, uh, either using entanglement or various types of superposition. And um, this, is, this is used for a communication. The primary use is for uh, making communications that cannot be intercepted or, or cracked uh, or broken uh, via Shor's algorithm. In general, I, that would be a separate uh, type of t uh, area of research. When you say um, that, in photon, photonics? Well, no, the, the quantum, com uh, f using photons for quantum communication. Okay. There are also efforts, as, as I was saying, and, and PsyQuantum is, is one of them, Xanadu is, is another, and there's several others that are actually able to make some of these gates that I, do, that I talk about, the Hadamard gates and the, the uh, two qubit control gates, those types of things, and put those on a chip and be able to perform calculations that way. The uh, advantage of photonics or the reason people are doing that is 
that photonics, if you're using it in a quantum computing setup, do not need to be uh, refrigerated down to the low microkelvin uh, temperatures. They, many of them, they can, all, they can run at room temperature and that's a, a big, big advantage. Okay. And people also believe that they'll have a much higher um, level of qubit quality. But still, people are working on them and we'll see if, how successful they are in, yeah. in actually making it happen. Okay, uh, one person asked a question that, uh, about how, what's a good place to learn and come up to speed on quantum computing? And that's a great question. And we're actually gonna address that in a upcoming session. We're gonna have a session where we're gonna do some training and background that you need to understand some of the more technical aspects of it. So stay tuned to your local uh, meetup and you'll hear from about that soon. Um, uh, Jan Young asked a really uh, a good question too is, which of the technologies, in your opinion, you think is going to uh, uh, come out on top? So I consider that the billion dollar question. Right. If, if we knew right now which technology was gonna come on top, we'd stop investment in all the other all right, technologies. Right. It, it's really a horse race. And I don't think anyone can really tell you definitively which one's gonna be the, the winner at this point. How about discussing some of the advantages between one and the other? Or are you going to get to later? Several people asked that uh, question around that theme. Which technology is good for which problem? Uh, again, it's, it's going to be har hard to say. Um, primarily because the technology, one of the reasons is the technology is moving so fast. You know, what I might say today based on... Um, Google's 53 qubit computer versus INQ 72 qubit computer, or whatever, that could change uh, very, very quickly. Um, the, the, the biggest distinction that people are making right now is between the quantum annealers and the gate level computers. Okay. So D Wave has been around for, for a long time. And uh, if, if you study the D Wave system, it is quite good at doing various types of optimization problems. Uh, many of the stuff they do works around what's called a QBO, Q-U-B-O, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization, where basically you try to find the lowest energy point in, in, in equation. And, and many, many problems can be formulated that way. But one thing it, it can't do, it can't run Shor's algorithm, for example, or Grover's algorithm, it to cannot, do, you think, you cannot do things. So it, it is highly dependent. It's, it's, it's also changing. If my recommendation, I, someone just asked this question on the website uh, yesterday. If my recommendation is if you have a specific problem, um, there are a number of software providers that I'll talk about in the next section that are generalists that are what are called hardware agnostic that actually work with multiple things. They have perhaps a little bit more experience mapping real world problems onto various computers and and they can um, maybe give you their opinions. I would also mention, uh, again, I'm sort of coming up, but part of the reason that Microsoft and Amazon, who just recently announced last year uh, a uh, cloud com quantum computing capability, they all, both of them right now, have three different hardware providers uh -huh. And part of the reason for that is it does allow their end users to experiment, to formulate a problem, let's say in Microsoft, in their case, in Q-sharp, and then run it on two or three different uh, computers to see which one comes up on top. So uh, again, it's still a lot of questions, but um, um, you, know, you might want to talk with someone who has been working with multiple machines or multiple platforms. Okay, uh, there's a few others, but I think this may be a good time to start talking about some of those software yeah, providers. Yeah, yeah, let me move on to the software providers because sure. that's uh, actually perhaps the largest number of, of customers. So um, after we get to the, um, the qubit controls, um, there's a next level which um, you might call compilers or backend or trans transpilers. And, and let me explain what those are. Um, if, if you studied any quantum computing, um, you're, you're always given what I would call the standard gates, the Pauli gates, the Hadamard gates, C-naughts, Toffoli's, those types of gates. 
And, and that's what um, I would say <laughs> almost all the education courses that you might get in quantum computing, that's where they'll start. It turns out that the hardware does not actually implement those gates directly. They implement uh, what, the, what they call native gates. Uh, for example, in IBM's case, I think the IBM machines only have three native gates. They have two single qubit gates, which basically can do rotations, then, uh, then the C naught, which is a, a two qubit gate. And in fact, um, different companies have different types of, of two qubit gates. When IBM does the C naught, the Rigetti, um, they, they do a control Z. They just also in, in, introduced a, another one, which uh, is a little bit more complicated. And then if you go to the ion trap machines, they use something that's completely different, which is called um, a Malmon a Sorensen gate. So um, the first thing that, uh, well, well, IBM calls it a transpiler. Some people might call it a, a compiler, is to take the programs that you've put out, put it in a standard gate, and translate it to these native gates that are actually supported by the hardware. Now the next step, and, and some, some are better than others, is what I'll call the optimizing transpiler. So if you just do a direct conversion, uh, you may come up with something that has a, a great number of circuit depth and um, the air rate may not, you know, and as the, because the errors stack up, as you add more and more depth, um, it may not, the air, the quality of the solution may not be all that good. So uh, a tra an optimizing transpiler is sort of similar to an optimizing compiler in the classical world. It'll take uh, what you've put out and it'll try to come up with a better way of implementing the same thing that use either fewer gates, fewer qubits, lower circuit depth, or, or and, and give you a lower error rate. Uh, and, you know, there are obvious, thing, obvious things like if you have two Hadamard gates right in a row, they cancel out each other. So, you know, you want to eliminate that. Um, other cases, if you have uh, certain qubits that have higher quality that you've been calibrated and better gate fidelities than others, maybe you want to change the circuit around so that you use those specific qubits that have higher fidelity more often than the ones that have lower fidelity. So it's, it's a big effort. Um, probably the, the best example of this effort was the recent IBM uh, quantum challenge that they put out at, at the beginning of, of last month where they had four different problems. And problem number four was to take a, a unitary matrix, which is a four qubit unitary matrix, and come up with a circuit for it with the fewest number of qubits and the fewest number of gates. And, and they, they assigned a score to the, to the various solutions. If you took what they had and just ran it through the standard IBM programs, uh, it would give you a, a circuit that had either 1400 or 1600 uh, Gates. They, they had a they have a score where I think each two qubit gate was just added ten, and each single qubit gate added one. And then they asked you to start um, modifying it and coming up with with it, it so it would be better. And a lot of people worked on that. Um, uh, some uh, I heard someone used a, um, an AI program or a machine learning program in order to do that, and they were able to uh, get the score down. IBM was able to get the score down from the 1600 there. They thought the best solution was 46. And uh, the week they ran that program, they had a few people who were very, very smart and actually got it down to 45 and it actually surprised IBM. So um, this is very important because the fewer number of gates you have and the fewer lower circuit depth, uh, the better the, the lower the error rate and um, the, the better the solution. And then last, um, I will also put in this class a translator, which basically will convert a program from one architecture to the other. And I'll I show that in the next slide. So you know, all the standard hardware providers, of course, have their own uh, compilers or, or, or transpilers. Um, and, and these would be the names of those. Uh, you know, IBM is this, this Kiskit, Terra. 
Uh, Google has one in CERT, Rigetti has it in, in their forest, and uh, D-Wave does it also for their machine. And again, it's different since it's not gate-based, gate but their latest is called Leap 2. But the other thing, which is a little bit more recent and which is a little bit interesting to me, is that other people are starting to support different architectures, uh, either software companies that are creating what I call uh, backends, separate backends for their software, or translators, um, and, and includes IBM, who is supporting um, the AQT, uh, which is the Australian, oh, I'm saying, Austrian quantum technologies, IONTRAP, uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing has multiple backends for IBM, Honeywell, and, and probably some others. QCWare has multiple backends. Uh, Honeywell actually created a, a backend that will take IBM Qiskit source and convert it to run on their ion trap with their ion trap machine. And Xanadu, which is also uh, has their own hardware, um, they also have a, a program called Penny Lane, which also provides a software backend for IBM. So um, you're going to see support for multiple architectures, uh, some translators there. Uh, the thing that um, I'm wanting to hear a little bit more details is Microsoft and Amazon. I, I mentioned a couple minutes ago that those two companies are offering cloud services to multiple uh, hardware providers. And um, the, the plan is so that a user could program something in the Q Sharp or, or whatever language Amazon decides to use. They have not announced it. And um, then you can switch back and forth between one or the other and see how it works out. So both of those guys are in beta right now. They've not publicly released the specifications, but I do believe that um, they will shortly uh, start releasing more information and we'll see how, how they can do that. Because uh, you know, supporting Mac multiple backends um, does take a little bit of work, but it is possible. Um, and then, you know, above the transpilers, there's what I would call the, the frameworks, you might call it operating systems and, and, and other things. And, and again, the, the major platform suppliers, IBM, Google, Rigetti, Microsoft, D-Wave, they do have their own frameworks. And the frameworks not only includes the programming language, it typically includes all the uh, mechanisms for submitting a job, queuing a job, uh, it includes ways to uh, run simulators for, for the software. And, and these are complete things. These are just not simple, simple languages, um, but, but they all supply those. One thing that was announced just a few weeks ago, which I think is very interesting, it's not received a lot of press, but we did write an article about it, um, is something called Delta Flow OS, which is an effort by the United Kingdom with about six or seven, River Lane is a software company, and several different hardware companies, all in the UK, to come up with a uniform framework that would be used with all the quantum computers in the UK. So that's still in the research phase, but, um, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how, how that turns out. Uh, Project Q is an effort that go, that's happening in ETH Zurich. They have created a, 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 a framework that can run, that has simulators, it has a programming language, and it can run on multiple computers, including um, uh, IBM's, Rigetti's, and, and, and maybe uh, some others. I think Circ also, Google Circ. Uh, Xanadu is, is a hardware provider. They're um, st still also in the, I'll call the beta phase. Their framework is called Strawberry Fields. And then uh, Amazon and, and Microsoft will have those. Now there are other, lots of other companies though, they're building uh, things on simulators. Um, Atos, which is a company in France, they have developed a dedicated hardware box for simulation. It, it uses classical technologies to simulate quantum programs. It's called a quantum learning machine but it, it does have very high performance because it is dedicated. It's not a general purpose computer and it does have uh, high performance 
it can simulate something like 40 qubits, if, if I remember correctly. And then there are a lot of startups as well as university projects that have all sorts of different software simulators. Uh, again, I list those on the tools page of the quantum computing report. Um, and they're all trying to come up with ways to use software uh, and, and classical computers to more efficiently and more effectively simulate the quantum programs. Uh, you know, as we know, the, uh, the quantum hardware is still a little bit sourced. It still has many errors. So if you're just writing a program and trying to debug it, sometimes it's better to start out on the simulator to get your software bugs, uh, bugs ironed out before you go to the hardware. And then there are uh, some specialty things. Uh, I call them workflow managers, development platforms. Uh, Zapata just introduced something called Orchestra, which is a workflow manager that also allows you to uh, be hardware agnostic. They could submit jobs to multiple things that does have uh, capabilities for um, holding your jobs, analyzing the results, submitting the jobs, those types of things. And Strangeworks also is developing uh, something similar. Strangeworks is still, again, in development, although I do expect them to announce, um, you know, publicly announce their capability within the next couple of months. So a lot of different software uh, companies, and, and these are, this is really all part of the frameworks and operating systems, not necessarily the applications. But the other development that's happened over the past couple of years, two, three years, is the development of software libraries. Um, you know, as, as we know, um, it gets very tedious to assemble, you know, write a quantum program and to write it at the gate level, even if you're using the, the, the standard, you know, poly gates and the Hadamard gates. Um, it's sort of like trying to program a classical computer in, in assembly language. So more and more people are coming up with libraries. So for example, IBM has a library that does many different things, uh, various quantum algorithms, chemistry, optimization. And um, for example, if you didn't want to run something like Grover's algorithm, rather than programming that gate by gate, uh, they have a library and be basically call it as a subroutine and, or as a macro. And it would allow you to, uh, it would generate the necessary logic for that. Uh, Google, uh, along with Brigetti, uh, are support something called Open Fermion, which is a library for chemistry. Microsoft also has one um, that they developed with, uh, I think, Pacific Northwest uh, Lab, which is called the uh, Quantum Development Kit Chemistry Library. And uh, again, recently, Google announced something called TensorFlow Quantum which is a quantum machine learning library that allows you to uh, call on that library to program. So these are all efforts to help accelerate the development of applications, make it a lot easier for an end user to you know, get on the air and to come up with a program that can solve their problems. So I expect to see more of these um, and, and the more the better because it'll really help the application side of things. And then finally, um, talk about I'll call application software companies. We're, we're tracking more than 70 different companies that are working on, on what I call the application side and uh, end user support. Uh, they're all many of them are taking a lot of different paths. There's a lot of uh, different strategies that they're working on. There are some that are, I would call uh, more general applications. They will work in, in the finance areas, in the chemistry areas, optimization areas, art of, you know, quantum machine learning areas, uh, and QCWare, one qubit, and Zapata would be examples of, of some of those. And then there are others that are saying, we just want to concentrate on very specific areas, like uh, finance. We'll develop solutions that um, can basically do quantum Monte Carlo or something like that to optimize portfolios or do risk analysis. Uh, there's a lot of work in computational chemistry. Uh, I, there's at least four companies I know of, there's probably more that are doing 
specializing in computational chemistry includes things like drug discovery, materials design. Uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, the pharmaceutical industry, for example. I know there's been some people talking about, can you come up with a uh, vaccine or a therapeutic for COVID-19 on a quantum computer? And it's, it's an interesting problem. Uh, I, I wrote an article about it. I don't, I think it's probably not quite the, the, uh, the quantum technology is not quite there yet. You just can't run, come up with a program overnight. But um, there is a lot of work there, and people do believe that this is going to be one of the most important areas in the near term, or in the medium term, for quantum computing. A lot of work in logistics. Uh, one that I just wanted to point out, which is a little bit interesting, is uh, there's a company in Knoxville, Tennessee, called Qubit Engineering, that is working on the optimization and placement of uh, windmills and come up with some programs uh, that could run on a quantum computer that can come up with those. But there's lots of work being done in, in logistics and optimization. Much of that work is being done on the D-Wave machine. There's, there's companies working in the artificial intelligence area like Qubit Logic, uh, but there's many, many others. And there are others that are working. Uh, BoxCat is a very interesting one. Uh, they're actually the, working in an area called image rendering um, one of the uh, big problems that uh, some of the motion picture and TV companies down here in Southern California have is called upscaling. Uh, how do you take an old film or an old TV show that was filmed, you know, 20 years ago with standard definition TV, how do you convert it so it runs to HD TV or even the 4K or 8K ultra uh, HD, HD TVs that are coming out now. And there are some very sophisticated algorithms that are, are able to do a reasonable job of upscaling. And BoxCat is actually working on some of that. So it's, it's a very interesting problem uh, and very unusual area for quantum computing. But um, I certainly wish they were successful. And then there are a lot of miscellaneous tools. Um, again, I, I list a lot of these things in uh, the tool section. There's also an open quantum software foundation that is listing tools there and it would re can re redirect you to web pages that uh, talk about that too. So I'll, I'll take another break here and see if any, any people have any more questions about yeah, some of the software uh, good, section. Good, good timing. There, there were two that uh, came in that were a couple that came in that are interesting is one you up to now haven't mentioned Asia the work that's being done there and there's quite a bit of work of course being done in Japan, Korea and especially in China. Uh, anything you want to say about that, the question you're asked? Yeah, there, there is uh, a lot of work being done in Asia. Um, some of the companies, there are a couple companies in Japan that are working on uh, quantum annealing. Uh, it turns out that one of the originators of quantum annealers was a Japanese professor. So there's still a lot of uh, activity there. Uh, Singapore is becoming a hot area. Um, there's a company called Horizon Quantum Computing that is working on a, a very, very uh, interesting thing. They have not announced uh, specifically what they're doing, but um, they are also working on making uh, quantum computers easier to use. People are using you know, certain classical languages to allow them to convert to a, a, a quantum, quantum solution too. Uh, there's a couple companies in Korea uh, there are companies in China. Um, there's a company, a hardware startup company, I think I mentioned in the hardware section called Origin Quantum Computing. There's a lot of government work in, in China. Um, and I, I do list whatever I know. It's certainly on the website, but um, the, the biggest problem with China is it, it's a little bit harder to get information what's happening there. China is definitely doing a lot of work in quantum key distribution and, and quantum communications. Um, and again, I, as I said at the beginning, I'm not gonna cover it in this presentation. That has received a, a lot of press. They're also doing a lot of work in quantum computing. Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a cloud service that uh, I think it's Baidu is offering uh, with the Chinese uh, Academy in, in, in this next section on uh, infrastructure. Okay, and there was a couple of related questions around uh, 
marketing and, and VCs, you had an interesting slide at the beginning where you showed, uh, I think it was 70 companies, almost all are classic startups to one degree or another. So uh, the, what maturity is the VC uh, investments like with some of those companies? Are there some trends? Uh, do, they, do they fall into groups? What's your sense of what the VC status is with? Uh... So I, I guess the best way to put it is it's all over the map. You have VCs who got in very early. You know, D-Wave got their first VC investment in 1999, maybe 2000, something, something like that. Wow, uh, 20 years. Wow. Yeah, I mean, but they've been around for a long, long time. Rigetti got some of their investments early. There are some that are being made. I, I actually, um, and, and a slide coming up when I talk about the support organizations, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more because I, okay. I keep track of VC investments and also mention that the speaker next week, I think is going to cover that in a lot more detail. Okay, and, and similar in, in a similar vein, are there any parts of the ecosystem that you think are undeserved now, underserved, that might be interesting for someone to look at if they were getting into the field? I, well, I, I would say that there's a lot of worries right now uh, at the government levels and, and, and various levels about quantum workforce development. Well, what's that mean? Well, what that means is uh, training engineers and scientists so they can develop quantum computers and program quantum computers. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, if, if you look at the uh, U.S. Quantum uh, Initiative Act, that, that's actually one of the key goals is, is to develop that. And the worry is that the industry will go grow fairly rapidly over the next several years, but one of the biggest limiters to the growth of the industry is they can't find people. So um, putting in programs, um, and, and you know, the, the government has a number of programs. In fact, people are, there's now talk about, um, I think Harrisburg University is going to start a program to start with uh, kids in high school to be wow. able to do that. Um, because up until now, up until very recently, um, if you look at who populated these quantum companies, quite frankly, it's mostly PhD phys physics grads or, or postdocs that people would hire. And, and many of these companies, you know, 50% or 90% of the company is that. But you just can't build a whole industry with PhDs. You need people, right. master's level people. You need bachelor's level people. So... Uh, there's a, a lot of um, it concerns right now, and, and there's a lot of activity um, that we need to beef that up in one way or the other, and, and that might actually be a good topic for another web, web, uh, webinar sometime later on. Okay, and, and before I let you continue, there's one interesting one that came in on, on the technical end. It said, is there, is there anyone in the commercial space working on higher dimensional qubits like quitrits and the like? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, however, I will say that if you can look at Xanadu. Uh -huh. Xanadu is looking at something which they call um, Q modes, which are continuously variable type of things. There's a whole math behind it. And um, they believe that a Q mode, you know, on a equal basis, a Q mode would be, you know, quantum computer with X number of Q modes would be more powerful than a than a, than a gate level quantum computer with X number of qubits. So that's the one thing that that's a little bit different than the gate level, um, as okay. well as, of course, the quantum annealing, which is a, a completely different thing also. But I don't know of anyone working on really higher dimensional type of uh, things. Okay. All right. Thanks. Continue, please. Okay. So uh, the last portion for the technology infrastructure portion, a uh, technology is uh, the cloud infrastructure and user communities and partnerships. So uh, the dominant way that people will be using quantum computers is, is through the clouds. And you know, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, quantum computers are very touchy. They require a lot of calibration, they require a lot of maintenance, a lot of spare parts. And it is not something that you could easily ship and, and sell, you know, ship on a Federal Express truck or something and, and get installed at a remote location. 
Uh, D-Wave has done it. They do have a couple of uh, customers that have their own machines. But I, I actually recently heard that D-Wave wants to move away from that. IBM, um, all their machines are, are basically in their facilities. Now they talk about the 18 machines which are in their New York facilities. Um, and, and that's either in Yorktown Heights or Poughkeepsie. Uh, and by the way, um, I know there's been a number of press articles about the 18 machines. I would also point out that IBM, in addition to those, has other internal machines that are, are for their engineers or for development that they are not even reporting. So they have uh, over, I think they have over two dozen uh, quantum computers in various locations. In addition, um, they are now, they haven't done it yet, but they are now uh, building a couple machines, one to go in Germany and one to go in Japan. These will be installed in IBM buildings, but they will be uh, basically um, serving those geographical markets too. So uh, keeping a, a machine up and, and putting together a cloud service is, is non-trivial. Besides you know, just the technical uh, maintenance requirements, you have things simple, well, not simple, but straightforward things like user access and permissions. You have to figure out how to work with queuing and scheduling jobs. And the other thing that uh, some people are looking at, uh, Rigetti, for example, is doing a lot of work to come up with optimal hybrid classical quantum computing support. Because a lot of the algorithms that people are using um, like um, QAOA and VQE, it's quantum uh, enhanced optimization and um, variable, a variable quantum eigensolver. Those basically take a problem and it shuttles data back and forth between the classical and quantum computer thousands of times. And uh, one of the things Rigetti has been emphasizing is this concept of co-location where they have placed a classical computer right next to their quantum computer so that uh, when you're shuttling the, this, these data back and forth, it only has to go uh, you know, five or 10 feet as opposed to 3,000 miles. So uh, keeping machines up are, is quite, uh, is, is, can be a challenge. Um, one thing I would point out, I, I talked a few minutes ago about IBM's quantum challenge where they, for four day period, they had people solve four different problems. They had something like oh, 1,500 different people. But in those four days, <clears throat> on, on those 18 computers, which are publicly available, they ran 5 billion jobs, five different quantum programs on the quantum hardware. So those machines were going 24 seven. And um, it, was, it was really quite a feat. Uh, particularly when you consider that the technicians who were maintaining all those systems were doing it in the middle of a pandemic. So, um, you know, it's, it's quite, quite a feat. And, uh, you know, IBM was certainly very, very proud that they were able to do that. And to my knowledge, there was no service outages. I, I, I actually ran on that quantum challenge and I never, you know, I, when I would submit a job, I might see a delay of 30 seconds or so, but I never saw uh, any, anything longer than that. So that was quite a feat. But anyway, um, there are people who are offering those services now. Uh, you talk about IBM, uh, D-Wave has their LEAP system. Uh, Rigetti has their system, uh, QCS. Uh, the latest one that was recently announced is QTech, Quantum Inspire. They, uh, that they're in the Netherlands and they have two machines that are publicly open right now. One is a five qubit superconducting uh, system and the other is a two qubit spin qubit system, which is the first um, spin qubit system that's been made publicly available. Uh, you asked about China, um, the Chinese Academy of Scientists, uh, Sciences and Alibaba do have a quantum qual and that is open. So people here in the United States uh, could access that. It's a superconducting machine, I believe with maybe a dozen qubits. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, something like that. Uh, the University of Bristol's had one on for a long time. In fact, I believe it's a four or five qubit photonic system that you can apply to access. I think that may have actually been available even before the IBM system, but that, that's available and I do have a link to it on my website. 
And again, I mentioned Amazon and Microsoft who are the two big gorillas in the uh, cloud computing world. Uh, they are both in beta right now. So I do expect over the next couple months, we'll hear more about those and uh, they will be making a big push uh, to grab people and, and to get more people using their services. So a lot of uh, activity here in the cloud infrastructure. Um, and people ask me occasionally, okay, well, what if you're a working on classified data, you know, top secret, maybe some government installation, uh, could there be uh, a remote installation? And, and the answer I think would be yes, but I don't think it'll ever be publicized. So I, I probably won't be reporting on it on the quantum computing report, but I, I do understand that some users may want to be able to uh, run quantum programs on premise. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, ATOS has a quantum simulation box that they will install. They'll sell you the box, they'll install it at your facility. And part of the reason that some of the customers have done that is for that very reason, because they really don't want to send uh, their top secret quantum program to some outside cloud supplier somewhere and have it possibly intercepted. So if you have something in house, um, you can do that. But I, I think that those cases will be the minority. I think the vast majority of quantum will be through the cloud really for the next uh, decade or two. And then finally, uh, I'm gonna talk about education and user community. <clears throat> As the industry is becoming, starting to mature, um, there's a lot of effort by some of these suppliers, particularly the bigger companies, to create a, a user community around your machine, around your platform. And the example or the analogy I would give is Apple versus Android for cell phones. You know, ev everyone is very, very um, loyal to their brand. You know, I use I use an Apple iPhone. I'll never use an I Android or or vice versa. And and they're trying to create something similar and, and doing many different things in order to do that uh, by creating partner programs um, and, and other things. IBM is by far the most aggressive in that. They have what's called the IBM Q network. And I'll, I'll show you some of the people, uh, some of the organizations that have partnered with IBM in the next slide. But beyond that, they have a lot of education. They have a lot of documentation and videos, uh, challenges, kids kit camps. Um, other companies, uh, they, IBM has videos, but other companies are doing, doing similar things. Maybe not quite as extensive, but they're doing things. Uh, D-Wave, Microsoft, and Rigetti all have uh, documentation on their machines. Uh, D-Wave has monthly webinars, for example, that will go through what they're doing you know, and uh, help teach you and help you learn about that. Microsoft has partnered with Brilliance. They have an education series called Microsoft Katas. Uh, Rigetti has various, various things. And um, you, you'll see a lot more of that, I, I think, as, as time goes by. I, I mentioned earlier that education and, and getting people to understand the technology is one of the, the key roadblocks. But um, there's a lot of work being done to, to try to help that situation. Another key tactic in this is establishing partnerships, which I have several slides coming up that will show that. Because you no know, one company can do it all. You really want to provide a complete solution and at, at times it's appropriate to bring in a partner in order to uh, work with end, end users to uh, get that complete solution. But I was talking about IBM. This is actually something they, they recently presented. They have this thing called an IBM Q network. And this is their latest status that they just presented. Uh, that they have 106 different members in this network. Um, you know, some are industry partners, some are hubs, that will allow you to submit jobs through those hubs. They have members, which are both uh, commercial companies and users, as well as nonprofits and uh, government and various government labs. They're establishing a large number of, of startups. These are all uh, software startups that are coming up. Uh, many of them are supplying the solutions. You know, many of the people that you see on the startup list I had shown earlier in the app on the applications page. 
um, and IBM is partnering with them so that uh, these guys might do consulting or software development for an end users and then run the program on one of the IBM machines. And then they're also partnering with a lot of uh, academic, uh, a lot of universities to do that. So they have a very extensive partner uh, network uh, of, of multiple types, uh, but other companies are having ones too. Uh, one thing that I show, I know this is a little bit of an eye chart, but again, you can go to the quantum computing report website and, and you can view this in much higher detail. But all the, the platform programs do have various four uh, platform suppliers do have software partners. And you can see along the top, D-Wave, Google, IBM, Microsoft, Rigetti, Amazon, even ATOS is partner, uh, partnering with um, Zapata. And uh, they've established these partnerships in order to be able to uh, get software support and to be able to uh, better service uh, the end users who, who, are, um, who need help in getting a quantum system on the air. Doug, a uh, quick question. Is that chart that's on your uh, report page, is it real time? Are you updating it uh, consistently or? Yeah, I, I, up, I update it whenever I, I update it uh, every time. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I typically I will update this every couple of weeks or so. Just made an update last week. So I try to keep this up to date. It's really impressive the amount of information that's broken down there. Yeah, yeah. And then on the on sort of the flip side, you know, I mentioned the, these cloud platforms. Um, these are the partnerships uh, who's supporting what cloud platforms. So I mentioned that IB, uh, Amazon, for example, uh, their partners uh, that they announced late last year were D-Wave, INQ, and Rigetti. Um, I do believe uh, at the time they made that announcement, they indicated they are looking more for, to add additional partners. And I would expect that uh, we'll be adding to this list also. And then again, the other big cloud company is uh, Microsoft, who's supporting Honeywell, INQ, and Quantum Circuits, which is a superconducting uh, company in Connecticut. So um, these are all partners, uh, IBM, uh, primarily supports their own, but they also, as I mentioned earlier, have a back end for Alpine quantum technology. Uh, right now, D-Wave and Rigetti um, are, are supporting their own. You can submit a, so in D-Wave's case, for example, right, uh, let, let's say Rigetti's case, for example, because I know that's live. Uh, if you have a program that you want on Rigetti, you can either submit it directly to the Rigetti cloud system or if you're lucky enough to get in the Amazon beta, you could submit it through the Amazon beta system too. So they're sort of, um, we'll say hedging their bets by uh, partnering with, with Amazon. So again, I, I, I do believe this chart will grow and we will be keeping it up to date in real time. So let me take a quick break there. And before I talk about the supporting organizations, just see if there are any questions. Y yeah, Doug. Um one person asked about, what's your sense if there's a quantum winter coming up? So <laughs> the way I would say that is whether or not there's a winter depends on your view. And let's go to a, a physical winter. You can have a lot of different view if in the middle of February, if you're sitting in Miami Beach or if you're sitting in Boston during a blizzard. Um, some companies are, are seeing issues and some are not. What, what I am seeing is that those companies which are trying to um, depend on, on venture capital, uh, private capital, there's definitely a much, much harder. I've heard uh, lots of uh, information that valuations are going down. Uh, the venture capitalists are being a lot more um, cautious these days. And, you know, if you're trying to get another round of, of financing, it's, it's, it's difficult, at least over the near term. Hopefully that will turn around. But that's probably true for all companies to be fair. Yeah, it's, it's true in general in tech, well, for many companies in technology. But what I don't see, I think the government funding is as strong as ever. So if you're a company that is lucky enough to get, or, or good enough to get, uh, funding from a government, you have a government project from NSF or NIST or 
from some of the other governments, which, and again, I'll, I'll start talking about that and supporting organizations, you will be able to get some, you know, very significant funding. So, um, you know, if you are a company that's trying to get, figure out where to get money, I definitely would look at every possible opportunity to get government from the uh, money from the government, wherever you are, because that's not drying up. That will continue. Okay, and here's a practical admin question. Several people have asked about, understandably, about the slides. I know we're recording the session, which will be available uh, from the meetup page, but will people have access to these slides? Yes, um, I, I, Deb can pr probably supply information about, um, we will be, we're recording the session and we will also uh, post the slide somewhere and Good. Uh, they will send out information on where to get that uh, once they, once this is all done. All right, thanks, continue please. Okay, so let me fi finish and talk about the supporting organizations. Um, a as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of activity in, in universities. Um, right now we're tracking 126 worldwide universities. Uh, there are 48 in the US. It's again about a one third ratio. Uh, and they're doing all sorts of things. Some of them are developing hardware, some are developing software, some of them are doing theoretical research, um, a lot of different things. I, I do have a list of uh, companies organized by country on the quantum computing report. Um, in addition, uh, there's a lot of nonprofits and government labs. We're tracking roughly 40, 40 of those worldwide. Uh, again, they're doing research and um, at some application development, hardware and software. Um, there was a question earlier about investors. So I, I do have tables that I, I don't necessarily track the amounts because uh, a lot of those amounts are proprietary and they're not made publicly available. I don't have really a good database for that. Um, but uh, I, I do track the number of organizations. So the, I'm tracking uh, 209 organizations and these are mostly venture capital. Some of these are government investment organizations and, and some, some angels and they're investing in a total of 72 companies. And I, I do show a table uh, on the website that shows which investors are investing in which companies and also the reverse, which companies have which investors. The that, other that's thing- a sizable, That's a sizable platform. It's something the industry- Yeah, uh, yeah, there, there, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, uh, and again, um, it, there, I may not have it all because I, I, there are a lot of situations where uh, people have not publicly announced and are not are, are in stealth mode and, and keeping some of this information undercover. Um, in addition to that, there's there's uh, various trade and other organizations. Um, the one in, here in the United States that's most prevalent is called the Quantum Economic Development Corporation (QEDC). That's actually sanctioned by the government. It's run by the Stanford Research Institute, but they have about 150 members, something like that, of, of people who are in the quantum business as well as end users. In Europe, there's the Quantum World Association. There's the Quantum Industry Coalition, which is uh, more of a lobbying group that is, is being uh, run by the Hudson Organization, Hudson uh, Group. Uh, one that was just came out like a week or two ago, which is really a, an organization for startups, is called One Quantum to help provide some guidance and help to for quantum startup companies. There's in Europe, there's a quantum flagship um, doing a number of different projects. There's uh, uh, the Swiss quantum hub. And um, I, I, I counted yesterday or a couple of days ago, the number of different meetup groups, you know, uh, Nathan at the very beginning mentioned about five or six different groups, but worldwide, um, you know, I went to meetup.com and I counted over 50 different groups including the ones in Europe and Asia that are doing meetups. And I, I by the way, I should mention Association Quantum also. I, um, I should have, I'm, I apologize for missing you, but I should have kept uh, Association Quantum on, on this list too. So there, there are a lot of uh, various groups that are uh, being formed and have been formed to promote quantum and to provide help to, to quantum companies. Um, and then, then there's the government. <clears throat> um, so I, I separate 
this page, the government funding from the government labs, because uh, basically the, the governments are uh, doing two things. One is they're supplying money. And this is a chart that actually was, was recently published by the Australian National Science Agency. They just put out a, a strategy document for the, the uh, country of Australia. And uh, they, this shows the amount of funding that they believe has already happened from 2017 to the present by different companies, so uh, different countries. So uh, United States is large, India, European Union, uh, and, and actually if you include not only the $1.1 billion of the European Union, but all the individual countries like the Netherlands and um, Germany, um, actually I don't see France in this list, but I think France has made some investments. The, the investments, government investments in Europe uh, might actually be greater than the U.S. I'm not sure. Uh, and the other one that we know is making large investments, but it's hard to quantify is China. They they publicized a couple of years ago that they were going to invest ten billion dollars in quantum technologies over the next five years. They were building a very large quantum research um, building. Um, uh, facility in uh, I think the city of Hi-Fi, Hi-Fi, and um, but I don't know how much of that they've already spent. Um, I also think a large portion of that may be going into quantum communications. Um, they're definitely in investing heavily in quantum com communications, so uh, but they may not be quite as much as the U.S. in terms of quantum computing. But the governments are certainly very interested. Um, many many governments see quantum technology as a strategic technology and they don't want to be left behind. Um, and I, I do know that the US, the Netherlands, France, and Australia have all put out strategy documents, uh, 50, 70 page documents that provide a high level roadmap of what they would like to see from in quantum within their company, uh, within their country. So they will be, uh, 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 they will be providing funds as well as other encouragement in order to grow that industry. They don't want to be left, left behind. So it's a worldwide race. So let me summarize. Um, and the, I know I've, I've gone through this pretty quick, but hopefully I've summarized it and organized it and, and shown you how extensive an effort it is. Uh, the quote I'd say is, it takes a village to build a quantum industry. You have hundreds of different organizations that are involved in quantum computing in, in, in many different ways, components, software, full systems, clouds, um, and you know, for many different areas, government, nonprofits, commercial companies, associations, the one thing I do believe is that partnerships will be vital. Uh, companies will need to be, will need to be, you know, get together and to work closely um, in, in order to make this happen. Um, it's a difficult technology. We need everyone to put their best brains, you know, to collect their best brains and to be able to uh, come up solutions to overcome the challenges. So. So I see that happening. I think that will continue. I actually think it, it probably will become even more dynamic. Uh, you will see a lot of changes in the ecosystem over the next several years. Um, there will be players that are joining, even more companies that are starting up. I think uh, I have already seen a few others that uh, have already gone out of business. I think you'll see uh, various mergers and acquisitions. And, um, it, it will be uh, it'll be exciting to track it over the next several years, but it's not going to stay static and it certainly won't be boring. So, so with that, um, I'll uh, leave it open for questions. This is my, the end of my presentation. I do want to thank everyone for attending. If you have uh, any additional questions or want to email me, my email address is there. Uh, and my website is at the bottom there, quantumcomputingreport.com and uh, I'll try to help you out or answer any questions that you may have. So with that, I'll, 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 the floor is now open for questions.
do you want to open the mics? I don't have access to that. No, I, I think um, people are going to have to type them in, in in the chat or QA or something. Okay, got it. Let's stop the share. Here we go. Okay, in that case, the, the, the um, most efficient thing might be for you to go in and look yourself at the Q&A and pick the ones that you think are pertinent to answer, as opposed to me reading them to you. Okay, you so I do see something. It's the first one I see from Terrell. Okay, Terrell Kramp says, uh, Doug, if you were forced to identify a company that might be working in quantum, but not yet gone public about doing so, a la the recent Honeywell entrance, what company would you suspect is likely doing some wizardry behind the curtain? Um, I would say um, the one, one company, startup company, most, most companies we know about, we don't necessarily, we know they're there. We don't know exactly what they're working on. Uh, on the startup side, there's a company called SciQuantum. We know that they're doing something in photonics. Um, they're talking about a million qubits, but, but they're not releasing any very, very many details. Um, they've, want, they've stayed in stealth mode um, for, uh, you know, for some time. Um, other companies, uh, AT&T is working on some quantum communication stuff. It's not been real public, but they're working with Caltech on some things. Um, I don't, I, I would say Amazon is not, uh, has, has other things happening. Uh, I think possibly Amazon might be developing their own hardware that's not been publicly announced yet. Um, they have a development group in here, uh, down here in Southern California and in, in Pasadena. So um, there are, are, are some companies, I, I think uh, HP, there's a lot of companies that are thinking about it, particularly the, I think if you're a large classical computing company that doesn't have a, a good quantum footprint, you know, possibly HP or Dell or Oracle, I think those, those are, those companies might want to think about, uh, well, this might be something that's important in the future. What should we do? And they may not set up their own group, but they may start establishing partnerships with, with uh, some of the companies that I mentioned so that they can get a foothold. Um, that would be you know, some of the things that I think we might, might see in the future. Okay. Um, Um, so do you, another one, it's sort of an, it's similar from an anonymous attendee. Do you expect any large corporation to invest in something like Photonic, NV Diamond Center, or Neutral Atom Technologies? So these are, these technologies, you know, many of these companies are, are what I would call uh, dark horses. And I'll, I'll name a couple. There's AeroQ, which is doing uh, cold atoms on helium. There's... Um, Atom Computing, which is doing Neutral Atom. Uh, there's Quantum Brilliant, which is doing NB Diamond Center. And the thing that you know people are always thinking about is what happens if one of these companies really comes out with a spectacular technology, they, they uh, build a better mousetrap, let's say, that is so much better, you know, it's a more scalable and higher quality than and what the big guys are doing with with a uh, superconducting or whatever they're working on. And I, I would expect that sometime down the road, uh, you might see some, if something like that happens, I think you'll see uh, acquisitions. And it's of course common in the classical world, uh, companies like HP and Microsoft and Google, all, all these companies, if there's a technology they want and they don't have it, they'll find a startup company and they'll acquire it. And that won't change at all when, when we get to uh, quantum. Um, <clears throat> see, I, I mentioned something on VCs. Uh, here, here's one. How does quantum computing go as far as Moore's law is concerned? Um, I actually have published a, uh, 
a website, um, an article uh, where I say uh, there will be a quantum equivalent to Moore's law. I think the title was applying Moore's law to quantum computing. Um, I think the scale may be somewhat similar. You'll see a doubling uh, every year, every, every 18 months. Uh, IBM has publicly said that. Honeywell's actually even gotten more aggressive. Uh, in, I, I, IBM was in terms of quantum volume. Honey's, Honeywell's is even more aggressive than IBM's. They say that they're not going to double. They're going to uh, increase it by an order of magnitude every year. So, so they're outdoing IBM. But the, the, the tricky thing that uh, Moore's Law didn't address is uh, in the semiconductor world, when you double the number of transistors on a chip, the quality levels of those transistors stayed the same or, or even got better. Um, and, and the problem in quantum computing is not only do you have to work to double the number of qubits, but you really want to improve the quality of the qubits too. So you really got to work on both at the same time. So um, definitely will be increases um, and, you know, in many cases, uh, you might be much better off if you're a hardware, in a, in a hardware development group, if you can double the quality of your qubits, you actually maybe come up with something that's even more powerful than doubling the number of the qubits you have. So I, I, I do, uh, you can look at the graphs that I have, the way I, I handle that situation is I show or uh, in quantum error correction, the, the, the metric that I use is the number of physical qubits to logical qubits. So uh, I'm sure you've all heard about quant error, quantum error correction. The big difference is that in, in classical error correction, the typical overhead is maybe 10 or 20% if you're using something like ECC or parity or, or something like that. Um, in Quantum error correction, it's much, much higher. People are talking about ratios of physical to logical qubits as high as 1,000 or 10,000 qubits. So that's why companies like Microsoft are trying to come up with a topological qubit because that could have much, much better quality. And although it may have error correction, the physical to logical ratio may only be 10 to 1 or 100 to 1. Um, but you'll see improvements in, in uh, both areas. Doug, there's one question you're quali highly qualified to answer it. I didn't want you to miss it. And were, there were a couple of them, actually, okay. which is about the job market. What's that look like? And I, I think the job market, um, if you'd asked me the question two months ago, I would say it was, it's roaring. Um, I actually no, had an engineer. Assuming, that, excuse me. Assuming that things go back to normal. Yeah, I think if things go back to normal, it'll go back to being, uh, being a, a great job market. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's big concerns in the quantum community and the government about not having enough people to, to do things. So um, if you are studying, you know, if, let's say you're, you're uh, an undergraduate right now and want to get into quantum computing, by the time you graduate, I think the, um, you know, the economic problems we have right now will have gone, will have, are over and you'll have a very, very good market to, get, to uh, graduate into. Um, there's a question from uh, Dave Chapin that uh, I'd like to answer, which is, I understand that many vendors such as Rigetti intend to perform quantum computing as a service. Which companies intend to sell complete systems? Um, and I don't think there's going to be very many, at least in a, a full quantum computer. Uh, at this point, they're just so difficult to support. Things like spare parts and calibration and maintenance. That's a big, big challenge. And, you know, companies in the classical world have giant organizations like Dell, for example, or HP will have giant organizations just to support that. And the, and the quantum, and it's um, even more difficult with, with quantum because the volumes are still low. So I, again, unless it's a, a top secret organization, I think they're gonna wanna steer everyone to the uh, cloud. 
and at least for the near term or maybe the medium term, um, just like as they just like D wave is is uh, has indicated that that's what they want to do now. Now, there are things that could happen, um, and I'll give it a, a an example of something that happened in the classical computer world when. Um, in the 1950s, 1960s, when the classical computers first came out, most of those companies were vertically integrated. IBM, of course, with their mainframes, they had their own operating system, they had their own semiconductor fab. Um, they would do everything themselves. Uh, there are companies like Univac and Burroughs, um, Digital Equipment Corporation, some of those you may have heard of, some of you haven't. They were you know, highly vertically integrated and um, basically, you would choose one of those machines and then that's who you were with. That's why IBM was so successful with their mainframes, the IBM 360s. A big change happened in the 1980s, and that was the uh, personal computer. So IBM came out, and rather than being vertically integrated, um, and they decided to come out with a personal computer. They got the, the software from Microsoft. They got the microprocessors from Intel, and the application software for, were from companies like Lotus 1, 2, 3. And uh, as a result, uh, that changed the entire computing industry. And, and now, of course, we do have, uh, in the 1990s, that created a lot of startups. There were 100 different startup companies that are putting these pieces together in the personal computer computing industry. Uh, could something like that happen in the quantum industry? I think possibly, but maybe in the in the longer term future that could happen. As I said, uh, Intel is developing chips. I don't know what they're going to do with those chips, whether um, they're going to sell them on the open market or just use them for internal use. Um, as well as I, I mentioned earlier, there are companies like Quantum Machines that are developing control systems, control logic. Is it possible that some companies could get to, could get into the market by perhaps uh, buying the chips from Intel and buying the control systems from Aquana Machines and uh, using software from Project Q as opposed to developing itself? It's possible, but um, we'll, we'll just have to see. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions. I'm just scrolling through them now. Um, Question, uh, there's a lot of uh, education courses. There's a reference in the Q&A uh, in in, or in the chat, the Q&A about EDX. Uh, Microsoft, um, MIT offers some very good courses uh, and others uh, through EDX, Asian startups. Uh, interchangeability, that's a good question. Um, right now, I don't, I don't see at the physical level, the hardware level, very much interchangeability at all. Everything is custom designed. Uh, for example, you couldn't put that Gopian glass enclosure, enclosure on a Rigetti quantum computer. Um, you might see a little bit uh, on the software side. I talked earlier about translators and you might see people take a software that was originally developed using Kiskit, ran on an IBM and running it through a translator and putting it on a Rigetti or, or um, s some other mach machines too. So, um, um, so I guess a question I mentioned on the Hadamar gate, what hardware had implemented the Hadamar gate? As, as I, um, I don't know of any, any, um, quantum computer right now that directly implements the Hadamard gate. Um, the way that if you put in a Hadamard gate and it gets uh, transpiled, basically that gets implemented as three rotations, three rotations uh, in terms of the, the native gate. A rotation could be a, a native gate, but no one is imp directly implementing a Hadamard gate, for example. See, so we talked about uh, Qtrits. I don't know any commercial company with Qtrits. Um, any open app 
axis optimization transpilers that we know of, which are suitable for tinkering, playing around. Um, I don't know. I know, um, you know, some of the companies do have tra good, some transpilers like Cambridge Quantum Computing and, and, and others. What I would check is the um, open could quantum software. Question, Doug, could you repeat that question? I didn't... Yeah. Thank you. Is there any open access optimization transpilers that you know of, which is suitable for tinkering, playing around? So um, what I would suggest is um, possibly you can go to the Open Quantum Software Foundation. I have, again, I have a link to it on my, my website. And um, I do, uh, they, they have a good web page and, and GitHub links to a lot of the quantum, open access quantum software that's available, the various programming languages, simulators, those types of things. And you can take a look at, at transpilers. I, I don't know anyone offhand that has one that's, that's open access, but perhaps there, there might be one or two that I haven't seen. Um, someone mentioned something actually important. Um, uh, Nixon Patel mentioned that uh, Baidu just released an open, a framework um, for uh, quantum machine learning called Paddle. And that is correct. It's similar, it's somewhat similar to TensorFlow Quantum. I do, I actually just wrote an article about that a, a week or two ago, but yeah, that is available and um, um, we can, you can take a look at it. Um, for all the frameworks and libraries are the functions simply recreated on a quantum setup or are they rewritten entirely to utilize quantum based optimizations? A, a, a rewrite of a binary search does not simply exist in QC or does it get amended with a Grover-esque search? So um, very, very little, uh, I don't see very much quantum programs that sort of are rewrites of, of classical programs. Uh, for example, the Grover search is completely different than a, a binary search. Um, what you will see every now and then, you'll hear a term called quantum inspired that, that people talk about. And, and basically the concept of quantum inspired is if you have a very smart researcher, programmer, uh, they will see a certain problem and they will see that someone has developed a quantum solution for that problem. And then they will say, well, how can I map that and possibly make a, a few tweaks, few changes, and use ideas from that quantum program, but I can run it on a, on a classical computer. So um, you'll see that more and more. Um, I, I think one example in, in the commercial space is something called um, QO, uh, is the, um, Fujitsu has a, something called a digital annealer. So basically that is something that uh, solves Cubo problems, which was describing with D-Wave, but they, again, they have a dedicated hardware called the digital annealer that can solve those Cubo, Cubo problems. So you, you'll see more of that, more people looking at uh, coming up with quantum inspired classical algorithms uh, by looking at a quantum program than, than the other way around. Okay, um, so uh, there's a question about China. It says, uh, can we be technically sure that China achieved the quantum teleportation from land to satellite that they claimed in mid-2019? What they actually uh, did was it was a quantum key distribution which uh, you know, would involve sending entangled photons or entangled qubits, and then using that to send a, a key, a, a key that can't be done. And uh, we, we certainly can be sure because uh, one station was in China and the other station that they sent it to over the satellite was, was Austria. So, so I'm sure, you know, we, we would not 
uh, the people in Austria would, would uh, you know, mislead us on, on any of that. So yes, we are, we're, we're you know, quite sure that they are doing a lot of work in this. Uh, quantum teleportation is a little bit different than quantum key distribution because um, that involves basically uh, sending an entangled qubit uh, for, from one place to the eye. I guess that's, that sort of could be portioned, but that's done in conjunction with some classical bits. So uh, Nathan, I think I've run through most of the questions. Are, are there anything else that you see or? Um... No, I agree. I think we're, uh, we've done it. Really good job, Doug. Excellent. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, and again, I'll invite you to look at the website. If you have some additional questions, you're free to email me. And then uh, um, Association Quantum or, or the Washington DC meetup group, they will be hosting the presentation as well as recording of this session. And you can take a look at that. And uh, I, I wish you the best of uh, luck and success in quantum. And again, I think, I think we will uh, have a very good um, next several years ahead of us. So bye-bye everyone. And we'll talk to you next time.